Almeida Theatre. Michael X by Vanessa Walters. Directed by Sherelle Skeet. As part of six artists in search of a play. Information from the Almeida's website about the play says, Orator and black power activist Michael X as he addresses the crowd at the 1965 Racial Adjustment Action Society, the lifeblood of the black man in Britain. His incendiary speech takes in his journey from Trinidad to Notting Hill and the destruction of the Caribbean dream in the face of British racism. The director, Sherelle Skeet, explains, Michael X represents the community hero that was created out of a desire to survive and thrive no matter what. Although the majority of the Black Power movement was captured in London, there were Michael X's all over the UK. Telling this story pays homage to the unsung heroes of inner-city migrant communities. The play is written as a monologue, but is performed by three actors, all of whom are of African heritage. They are Martina Laird, Tommy Ugbaro, and Mika Onyx Johnson, and all perform with scripts in hand. Martina is 50 and slim with light brown skin. Her brown hair falls to her shoulders in corkscrew curls. She wears black trousers, vest top and jacket with flat shoes and accessorises with gold jewellery, including a pair of large hoop earrings. Tommy Ugbaro is in his late 20s, tall and heavy set with short afro hair and a neat trimmed beard. He wears dark grey shorts to the knee with a red toned collarless shirt worn with the sleeves rolled up and he wears trainers. When he arrives in the space, he has a large African drum worn on a strap across his body. Mika Onyx Johnson is also around their late twenties, with slightly longer afro hair and a faint beard and moustache. Their frame is heavy set, and they wear a silver nose ring, the kind that's worn through the septum. They wear black knee-length shorts, with a black and white bandana hanging from their back pocket. They also wear a t-shirt with a tie-dye pattern of neon green and white, and a pair of beige suede ankle boots. The Almeida's auditorium creates a simple backdrop for this rehearsed reading. The bare brick of the theatre's curved back wall is lit in soft tones. On it are a number of flyers advertising the evening's gathering with slogans that include Ras, your brother needs you. Black power, people's power. I am a man. And Ras, join up now. The floor nearest the audience is a patchwork of wooden panels. At the back of the space, following the curve in the back wall, are two tiered sections, each a step higher than the other, and a couple of metres wide. Three chairs are set out along the first tier, with a gap of several metres in between them. The actors arrive through a door in the left of the back wall, first Tommy playing a drum, followed by Mika and Martina. They smile and make eye contact with the audience. Mika. Well, there are some people here already. That's what I like to see. Salam alaikum, brothers. Tommy. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Greet your neighbors, get to know each other. Martina. This is gonna be a life-changing day for all of you. Hey, sister. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your support, brother. Get a seat but for the organ. Fill up from the front now. That's right. Mm. Don't want to get lost in the back. It's all right, man. No, you're not missing nothing. Yeah, so far. Salam alaikum. You've made a big journey by coming here today. Now, it's just a short walk to your seats. You might want to take your coats off. Is it just me? Feels warm. Do not crowd the doorways, please. Other people are coming in right behind. And they said we'd be empty. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, you listen to the man, you lose your mind. You lose your mind. You lose your mind. So I'm going come, sister. How was your journey? Madam, mm, <laughs> looking very elegant tonight. Very nice. In fact, all the ladies here, what a lovely sight. Good evening. And again, 
Thank you all for coming. I am Brother Michael Abdul Malik. Formerly Michael De Freitas. So, thanks to some overzealous journalists, many of you now know me as Michael X. What's the difference? I'll tell you in due course. Salam alaikum. Who here knows what that means? <laughs> Put your hands up, anyone? Yeah? yeah? Okay, yeah, a few hands, a few hands. For those of you who don't know, it's Arabic, it's a greeting, but it doesn't just mean hi or goodbye or see you later, right? It means peace mm. be upon you. Mm. It's a Muslim prayer. And it makes a difference, big difference, knowing what a man means when he says, Salaam Alaikum, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Huh? Doesn't it make you feel different mm. when you know he means you some good, yeah, rather than just acknowledging your presence? Mm. But if you don't know what it means, it's just, hi, goodbye, yeah, see you later. <laughs> so you see, if you speak a man's language, you're sure to understand him. Mm. I'm sure you agree. So today, I'm giving a lecture in language. <laughs> yeah? You see, people assume that the English language of the black and the English language of the white is one and the same. Mm -hmm. yeah? This is a false assumption and one that is the source of many racial tensions. Let me give you some examples. Take the N-word. No law against it. Yeah? But why is it that the word nigger spoken by a white man makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up? But in the mouth of another black man, it's just a word open to interpretation like any other. I talk to my boys. We're all happy. You call me boy. I might break your nose. Mm. <laughs> you see the difference? <laughs> when you say your brother, you mean your brother in blood. When I say brother, I mean my brother in life. Because we are the sons of the same fortune, if not the same parents. You say man, I say the man. man. <laughs> Sometimes it's not even a word. Sometimes it's a walk. She leans forward, legs fluid, arms swing low. Mika and Tommy join mm -hmm. in. A fist, a nod, that says volumes. I like it when I'm walking down the street with a white person. And I pass a black person and give a little nod, <laughs> as you do. Mm. And it really throws the white person's nose out of joint. <laughs> yeah. He immediately asks, do, do you know the chap? <laughs> He wants to know why two black people are nodding at each other. To them, you know, is it a conspiracy? A secret handshake, yeah? To them, it's straight out of the tale of two cities. Mm. You know, during the French Revolution, the poor called each other Jacques to escape detection by the police. They would pass each other in the Parisian bars, saying Jacques under their breath. Yeah. Actually, it's pretty similar to the nod. It's true, you've never met the brother, you don't know his name, but you see him, right? In a world where we are not given a voice, recognition, a platform on television, you see another brother in a way white people don't. Your nod says- She points to people in the audience. You matter. You're important. Mm. We're here. <laughs> 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 what time is the revolution and who is DJing? So, where did this begin? This divergence in meaning. When did one word begin to mean something for me and something entirely different for you? 
To find out, we gotta go back, way back, back into time. Mika gets up and steps into the center. <laughs> back to when life for me and life for you began to mean something different. When in the horrors of the great slave trade, human for you and human for me became something very different. Take this page. To you, it's just a white page, right? You're not upset by the white page, are you? That would be ridiculous, sir. <laughs> a white page doesn't oppress you, intimidate you, remind you of your inadequacies, make you feel unclean. Uh, to touch it, make you feel guilty for defiling it. Hmm? You don't feel its cold spiritlessness pervade your soul. It's just a page for crying out loud, sir. Right? White is auspicious, favorable, honorable, or generous. White is pretty, black is ugly. Heck, that's what my mum would tell me every day of my childhood. She was Bayesian. Any Bayesians in the house tonight? Damn, <laughs> hate those Bayesians. <laughs> Yes, Massa. No, Massa. <laughs> Three bags full, Massa. All of them desperately trying to ape the Massa's Englishness. They even called the island Little England. Mm. <laughs> That's how much they love white people. Forgive me, my Bayesian brother. Of course, I'm just trying to make a point here. I love my Bayesian brothers. Every last brown nose in one of them. <laughs> <laughs> my point is, that like a lot of black people, Bayesian or not, just like my mother, a descendant of slaves and one of the blackest people I know, white is pretty, black is ugly. It wasn't easy being the red bastard of a Portuguese merchant who took up with my mother, then took off. Halfway to something and still nothing. She was one frustrated woman. <laughs> Mika begins to move to the beat, slow at first, arms hang at their sides, hips low as feet pound the floor. Look how nice and clean and nicely painted those white people's houses, Michael. She used to say, when you're grown up, we're going to live around here. At other times, she'd say, I don't want you playing outside. White children don't get dirty. Or, oh. don't play with those black boys, or you better be ready to cut down a branch from the guava tree. They're it's all too true. hardened. I don't, I don't want, want them, them in this house. house. They're, They're too, too black, black to, to come, come in here. here. As I got older, it was... You're not having any black girls in this house. Take your nose out of the gutter. Never look under your feet for company. Look up. Well, now I am looking up. But what do you think I see? Beautiful black people standing up tall, deciding that they're not going to take that sort of talk anymore. I know what it's like out there. I know what's happening in Brixton, in the East End, in Notting Hills Grove, in Cardiff's Bay, in Manchester's North Side, and in Nottingham's Meadows. Thrown into Black Mariah's, getting bricks through the letterbox, and feces through the window. Getting slapped up when you're this big with child. Having your ribs kicked in just for walking past certain streets. And even if you're not scared to death, you're pissed off, right? Mm. Being called ugly names, like Spade, Coon, Nigger, Wog. Have I missed anything out? 
Come on. I know you've been called worse than that. Anyone been called Sambo recently? Or Mungo? That's pretty old. 19th century, I believe. <laughs> A new one for me is eggplant. It's American, apparently. Eggplant. Here, the equivalent would be aubergine. Mm -hmm. A long purple vegetable. I guess aubergine is just too much of a mouthful. Mm. Yeah. Why say in three syllables what you can say in two? Yeah. Hmm. Some education for those of you who thought there was perhaps just a couple of words to put a brother in his place. Don't go home saying we didn't teach you anything here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just us grown folks suffering. I know what's happening to your children in the playground. My five-year-old daughter attends Rothfield School, Islington. And when she plays Ringa Ringa Roses, the white girls won't take her hand. She's getting the same shit I'm getting. White is pretty. Black is ugly. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Well. If it's so bad, why'd you come here? Fair question. <laughs> Sometimes I even ask it to myself. Why did I come here? For all this suffering I get, yes, I half wish I had stayed put. Because if it's one place on the earth I love, it's Trinidad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it will always be the garden of my youth. The place where I climb trees and jump gorges and run through coconut groves with bloody feet and thumping hearts. London could never compete with Port of Spain for my affection. Yeah. The narrow streets of open fronted shops crammed with bright colored mm -hmm. bales of cheap cotton, cast iron cooking pots, <laughs> straw hats and trinkets, Ooh. the big stores and banks and coconut carts where Indians Ooh. slice the heads off of green coconuts with pirate cutlasses for the thirsty <laughs> crowds to drink. Why? I close my eyes and I'm still there in the doorway. But I'm Chatting in the doorways, the Chinese shopkeepers, the Indian ladies in their pale colored saris, the haggling Syrians, the well dressed Portuguese, uh -huh. <laughs> the legions of Negroes sitting in barber shops, drinking in cafes, munching banana, and brushing <laughs> past me as they go about their business. So, Trinidad was the place, believe me. Mm. Mm -mm. So it's a good question. Yeah. Why did I come here when sunshine and a warm beach cost me nothing? Well, I always dreamt of coming to England, man. Mm. We would look at the white people in their tall houses across the sewer from us. Their houses had plumbing and clean streets. Now we watched them getting out of their motor cars and off ships in fine tailored clothes and hats and pretty gloves and hats and shoes. And we would think of the queen up there in her palace and her castles. England was home in the mind of every small boy in the West Indies when I was growing up. It was taught to us too. There was not a West Indian in the house tonight who doesn't know what I'm talking about, who didn't learn about the motherland. It's glistening streets, it's laws and customs of the great English men who sat the Germans. <laughs> who brought us cricket, mm -hmm. Christianity, mm -hmm. and civilization. They turn to the back, holding up imaginary mini flags. They wave them and turn back to face us with wide grins. As the back wall is flooded by bands of red, white, and blue light, they pause with a serious look and a hand over their hearts. Tommy sits with the drum. Martina begins to dance on the spot, moving arms wide and fluid, stepping back and forth as she turns in a circle.
she stops. Who was Michael De Freitas? He was just another Trini boy with a little more education than the average who got expelled from school. Mm. Generally expelled from most places after some time. They used to say of me, that boy is going to end up on the hangman's road. <laughs> what was special about me? Nothing, except that I love ships. Boy, when I was a kid, <laughs> I would spend hours fashioning boats from bits of old wood, covering them with candle wax and lining them up for a race in the sewer. As early as I could, I ran away to sea, and I sailed the world as a seaman, and eventually made it to the motherland. My first view of England had all the enchantment of the exotic Christmas cards we'd seen <laughs> as a small child. I guess you think exotic is a brown woman in a grass Mika skirt. and Martina do a hula dance. To me, exotic was a cosy, white-lined, topped houses, a blanket white coastline. We were taught to sing exotic Christmas in school. Good King Wenceslas. Deck the halls with bows of holly. And the books we had had pictures of ruddy-cheeked Englishmen and women and their children sitting around the fire, having the best time of their lives. I was a child looking at this new world, eager to go, but at the same time, intimidated. What's they look that? about. And that! And that! Eyes darting left and right at their new surroundings. England! Oh, my fellow sailors! Fish and chips! Jellied eels! <laughs> Lord, I was turning blue on the deck as we drew closer. People, I started making them out on the shore. Boy, oh boy, here I was at the motherland. The days of hanging around the waterfront in Trinidad for jobs, gone forever. Now, we've heard of the American dream. Mm. James Truslow Adams coined the phrase in the epic of America. It is not a dream of motor cars and high wages, merely, but a dream of social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable mm -hmm. and be recognized by others for what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth or position. Mm -hmm. We know about the dream of coming to London. The scullery boy, Dick Whittington, became the thrice Lord Mayor of London. But can someone tell me, what is the Caribbean dream? You see, a life in the Carib Caribbean is a life of no prospects. Mm. Hmm? You love your country, right? Your island, whether it's Barbados, St. Kitts, Jamaica, <laughs> or a little sandbank in the middle of the ocean. But you don't own anything. Mm. You work your little patch of land, maybe pick your coconuts and papayas. Go to the beach, feel the sand on your toes, but there's no money. You want to buy a new dress or a pair of shoes, can't afford it. Time to get a decent job, mm. can't. You might be given a broom and told to sweep, a yard or a pot and told to cook. If you're light-skinned, you might be given a pen told to write something. You might even get a uniform and be called Mr. <laughs> but you still don't have a stake in your own country. Mm. They say slavery is over. But in your own country, you're hardly free. It might be independent now, but the Caribbean is still all owned by Europeans. Mm. The whites, the English, all the oil refineries, the sugar estates, hotels. What do you really have besides a flag? In the Caribbean, when I was growing up, you couldn't get into certain educational establishments if you were black. They were for the whites. You couldn't get a superior job. 
those are for the whites. You couldn't live in certain areas, go to certain bars, or even dress a certain way. It was all for the whites. Under those circumstances, what was I leaving? Mm. I might as well have come to England. Shit, doesn't England owe us something? I said, doesn't England owe us something? And what about you? No? You don't think England owes you something? Or you, sister? You're content. You don't want to work. You just hang around on doorsteps moaning. England should be for the English. There's people in this area what's got it a lot harder than you. You or you. Living a lot worse than you. Been living like that for hundreds of years and you don't hear them moaning about what England owes them. Even though they're bloody English to start off with. Go up Southam Street any day and you'll see what I'm talking about. There's a queue. And you lot, you've got to learn to queue. <laughs> That's the English way. And while I'm about it, too right they need an act. Ever since this bleeding Commonwealth, you've been coming here from all over the world. <laughs> I'm not racist, what? I'm just saying, the government needs to close the door quick before the lot of you turn up and stink this bloody island. Uh, what? <laughs> What a surprise. Eh? The white man doesn't think we are owed anything. Mm. Mm. But what about slavery? Mm. Mm. Hundreds of years of transportation from Africa to the West Indies. Mm. Our history stolen. Our culture, heritage, languages gone. Mm. Our freedom, our lives, millions of lives lost through murder and hard labor. No sense of self, trapped in servile roles on plantations, paid nothing, and no way of rising above. It's not slavery, but it's still going on. Never mind that West Indians have fought for queen and country. Why can I get a job as a seaman on a Norwegian boat, but not on an English boat? <laughs> mm? Mm. We didn't fight for Norway. Mm. <laughs> Yet, they don't mind giving us jobs. We're good enough to die for England, but not to work for them. Mm. I tell you, I've been to a lot of places on those Norwegian boats. Europe, Africa, Canada. And it doesn't matter where you go. Black people around the world are at the bottom of the social pile. They are the poorest, with the jobs that are left once the white people, the white poor people, have taken what they want. Mm. They suffer the worst crime and live in the worst areas. During my time at sea, I had plenty of opportunity to learn what a white-orientated world this is. Go to America, they are the back of the bus, mm. giving up their seats for white people. Mm. In Africa, it's terrible poverty, children starving, crying, begging. In South Africa, a black man cannot even buy a beer as the bars are only for Indians and whites. Here in Europe, we are a surf nation, and they sometimes entertain us. <laughs> Yeah? The invisible class toiling away in the kitchens and basements. In all I've seen, it seems to me that West Indian people in Britain are probably among the most abandoned people in the world. Abandoned by the host country, abandoned by their own countries. Mm. They exist without a culture, a language, a sense of self, and where they are going. This is why you've come here tonight. Mm. Because you're scared. You see that there's nowhere else to go where the black man can get a break. You feel abandoned, but you've passed a point of no return. When you came to England, a lot of people back home said you wouldn't make it. <laughs> Those same people are waiting in the ports for the ships to come in. 
and for you to roll off shoeless and hatless so you talk it up in your letters home, regardless of the hardship. Because we're now in the motherland, baby. <laughs> 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 but it's hard. English people not easy, man. Mm. They don't like us. Even those of you here, deep down, be honest. <laughs> Even if you smiled at brother on the way in, you don't really want us to be here. And of course, there are some Negroes here who think that if you hold your head a certain way, if you try extra hard to smile, <laughs> gives a cheesy grin, and step to the side of the street and let the good white people pass, that you're going to be accepted. But no matter how hard you try, you cannot escape the impact of being black. You register at the labor mm. exchange and the jobs never materialize. Mm. You see job after job after job advertised in papers, but as soon as you apply, they disappear before your eyes like a mirage. <laughs> you can't find a room nowhere decent. The adverts, they say, Europeans only or Anglo-Saxons. I looked that up in the dictionary. It said a Germanic people inhabiting England during medieval times. <laughs> like, how do they know whether someone is Anglo-Saxon or not? How do you prove you inhabited England during medieval times? Do you have a special passport saying Anglo-Saxon? <laughs> do you have to practice pagan worship? Maybe have relatives living in Stonehenge. I prefer it when they say, when they call a spade a spade, excuse the pun, and just say, no dogs, no Irish, no blacks. At best, black and white can have enough things in common and enough joy mm. to share between them to be colorless most of the time. But it's impossible to forget who you are all the time. The pigeonhole you've been placed in, the imposed division people have created in which color is such a prominent example. Mm. No white man can know how a black man feels when he walks down the road. Mm. And when white men ask me what I would do if I were them, <laughs> I can't possibly say that I'm not them. But I know. I'm not going to go back. Are you? Hmm? Are you going to fuck off home? The black man has been drained of his blood for too long trying to please Massa. And now he needs to make a stand. He needs to stick with his own, mm -hmm. build something, have some mechanism for taking back what England owes us. So, mm, mm, mm. I give you the racial adjustment Action Society. Ross. Yes. Mm. The lifeblood of the black man in Britain. Ross. Mm. Embraces the politics of revolution, the politics of change, mm. the politics of a new system. Mm. But we are about love, mm. not war. In a little more than a year, we have transformed this area. We've set up the London Free School, offering subjects as diverse as painting and daily living. We set up the paper, the Grove, mm. Mm. Defense, a project for the legal defense of black people. Music! Two and a half thousand of you Black and white, enjoyed our Notting Hill, fair and pageants, with floats and steel band, <laughs> poetry readings, jazz, in a real carnival atmosphere. No council help mine, but we're going to do it again next year and the year after that. Among our aims, apart from uniting colored people in Britain, and guaranteeing their human rights or the promotion of trades, industries, and businesses. 
run by black people to make them less dependent on white capital. The establishment of centers for physical, educational, social, and cultural activities. The creation and cooperative housing projects. Mm. Provision of legal advice, mm -hmm. either free or on low terms. And professional advice for the management of business. And these are just some of the most practical points in a long program intended to give the black man a fair deal. It's ambitious, I know, especially for a backwater trainee who frankly was hustling his way through 66, trying and failing to get an education, trying and failing to cut my ties with the ghetto. One day, I go on to eat at the Congress for African Unity headquarters up in Earl's Court. They had a nice scene going on there with jollof rice, mm. fried fish, curries, yeah, that sort of thing. Mm. They had interesting books, interesting people. I was sitting down when a light-colored man, a light-colored black man, with a little goatee and a fur hat, entered with a small group. He was handsome, you know, much like myself. <laughs> and just very familiar looking. The group sat at an adjacent table and I listened to him saying interesting things about the black man, American, and sounded just like this guy, my barber, Naki Blake, was always quoting. You've been hoodwinked. You've been had. You've been took, bamboozled. Naki would say over his clippers. <laughs> the future belongs to those who prepare for it today. I realize. <laughs> This was Malcolm X from the newspaper, the black Muslim. But I don't know what to expect. The press reports Muslims as if they are lunatics with unrealistic goals. I introduced myself and we spoke for a few minutes and he came wrong later that evening. I followed him wrong and listened to his speeches. He, he really swung his audiences. He told the truth. He exhaustively researched his material. He never went anywhere without a little black bookcase, a mobile library of statistics of black America. Before he flew out, I was showing him around Notting Hill, the poverty of it all. And he said, so, what are you guys going to do? What are you guys doing in England? And what do you aim to do in the future? Malcolm X looked at me in the eye and said, what are you going to do? What a difference a day makes. <laughs> she steps back to sit. <laughs> the name Michael X always makes me laugh. Huh. I didn't choose it. The press come with their flash bulbs and their big head headlines. Race war, flashpoint, black militants. I don't mind the attention, it works for me. It gives me a mouthpiece. Thanks to them, I am now the best known black man in the world, or <laughs> soon I will be. <laughs> I'm still a nigger, but I am that excruciatingly handsome. Ooh. Ooh. Tantalizingly brown mm. and fiercely articulate nigger uh -huh. that they love to hate. 
<laughs> like Martin and Malcolm Martin. and Muhammad Ali. And my legacy will live on in this country 30, 40, 50 years from now. People will read my autobiography and be saying, that cat was not afraid to tell the truth. <laughs> he didn't hide behind a suit and a tie. He made people's lives better. I am not here to overthrow anybody, despite what some papers would have you believe. It's like I said earlier. If you listen to the man, you'll lose your mind. I'll give you an example. Uh, 1958, race riots in Notting Hill. It was all over the papers. Violent eruptions and all that. The thing is, and this is what the BBC won't tell you. They were not real race riots. People are always fighting in the ghetto. The clubs are always being invaded and broken up. And this was midsummer, August 1958, a time when violence is always nearest to surface, particularly in poor, crowded neighborhoods. And there were tales of blacks being set upon by the teddy boys in their mm. quiffs. Mm. and shiny shoes up at Southam Street. Mm -hmm. At this time, it was just rumours passed around in clubs and bars. And yes, the odd skirmish. A West Indian man was shot in the leg. A petrol bomb was thrown into a club. Nothing was going on on the streets. Nobody was getting worked up until the phrase race riots appeared in the newspapers. The police covered the streets of Notting Hill. They grabbed black men and bundled them into cars and off to the station. At the station, they were forced to take up a weapon, be it a broken bottle, a knife, iron, razor. If they didn't, they were kicked around until they did. They were then fingerprinted, and told to sign for the weapon and charged. There was now a situation. Mm. Media exaggeration had brought sightseers into the area in the thousands. Now, I don't mean people with sun hats and picnic baskets. Yeah? <laughs> a defense was required against the police. White people, anyone who raised a hand against us, black people stuck together. White people stuck together. Suddenly created out of nothing, you had it. A race riot. Mm. But real race riots are coming. Conditions are actually worse now than they were in 58. Just a couple of years ago, remember that conservative slogan in Smethwick? If, if you want, want a nigger for a neighbor, neighbor vote, vote Labour. And guess who won that election? Mm. Here's a clue. It wasn't Labour. <laughs> Last year in Wolverhampton, 150 white savages attacked the house of a Jamaican family because they didn't like the color of their skin. When, when Six white people arrived before the magistrate the next day. He described the whole thing as a neighborly dispute. Mm. Another neighborly dispute means a black boy lies in hospital beaten with iron bars and left for dead for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Color bars are in force at London Underground. You might get a job wiping down the walls, but there's not many hotels bars and clubs that will, will even serve you. Today, I'm talking. Mm. Mm -hmm. Not 20 years mm -mm. or 10 years ago, mm -hmm. when we just reach, I'm talking today. today. There's not one of you that has not been made to feel afraid in this country. Felt, not felt persecuted, shut out, avoided, threatened. There are swastikas all over Stoke Newington. 
And a new group called the National Front recently tried to kill me and my family. Petrol bombed my house. Don't look to white people for help here. White people don't run to black people for protection, nor the blacks to the whites. They are white first, and you must always remember that. The government does not care about you. It just cares about closing the door to black people. This new act, Race Relations Discrimination Act, I am the first man to have been convicted under it. A black man <laughs> imprisoned for speaking the truth. For the race, really. You couldn't make it up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for the young black people born here and growing up knowing no other society. At school, at school, get very friendly with the white children of their own age. But when they go to the labor exchange with their equally qualified white friends, they find that the white boy gets a job and they don't. They find then that they can no longer mix with their white friends. Ross is the only group that understands the problems in this country and has real solutions, which is why it has captured the imagination of the great and the good in this She country. holds a collection bucket. I'd like to thank some people who have helped its establishment. People from all fields, journalists like Colin McGlashan and Jill Tweedy, aristocrats like Gail Benson, Lady Curzon, Carmen Gerard, thinkers and activists like Alex Trokey, and John Hopkins, even stars such as John Lennon donated a lock of hair for an auction. <laughs> you laugh, but you know, you know how much a lock of John Lennon's hair goes for these days? All because they understand the need for change. She shakes the brass collection bucket. That it's time for people to fight back. Mm. Not with their fists, but with their shillings. Their guineas. Mm. Holds out the bucket to the audience. Their two bob and sixpence. It's suddenly gone very quiet in here. <laughs> yeah. I can feel that shift. Some of you are now slightly restless, <laughs> looking skeptical, maybe wishing that you sat further at the back. <laughs> yeah? Let me no? guess. <laughs> you were with me until I asked you for money. Maybe that's just to be expected. You've heard bad things about me. You're cautious. Look, people call me a leader, so I lead. Maybe if they called me a dancer, I would dance. <laughs> a clown, I would act the fool and have an easier life. <laughs> I didn't ask to be a leader. I didn't wake up one morning and say I'm going to lead black people to the promised land. I didn't have a dream, like my other inspiration, Martin Luther King. I just saw that there were things I could do to make a difference. And this is what I could do. Ross is what I'm bringing to the table. So who is going to bring about change, if not me? Who is going to represent the black man in this country? Who is going to speak their language? Mm. There are other organizations out there that claim to speak for the black man, but do not speak for him. White Run Card, the campaign against racial discrimination. A lot of good and proper things to say about racial harmony. One problem, no one's listening. <laughs> if you don't put your hand in your pocket and donate to Ross, things are going to come to a frightening head. In Parliament, they, they give it grand titles. Yeah? The wind of change, blah, blah, blah. In the ghetto, they just say, burn, baby, burn. Mm. It doesn't matter if you say it in a black man's language or the white. 
real race riots are coming to Britain in the next year or two. And we are not talking a few petrol bombs. Conditions are intolerable and resentment is growing. When I'm in the ghetto, I'm hearing my brothers saying we should burn this fucking slum down. Mm. They don't want to compromise. What can they compromise when they have no house? No job, nothing. Black people cannot sink any lower. Eh? They have nothing to lose. <laughs> Meanwhile, white people are mobilizing against us mm. through the courts, through parliament, and on the streets, planning further attacks against our women, our homes, our livelihoods. Is this the England we want to raise our children in? A country who denies people jobs, homes, and livelihoods based on the color of their skin. We might not be in Detroit, but the thoughts and voices in the ghetto are the same now as the thoughts and voices of those black people suffering in the US that you read about every day in The Guardian. Mm. The church bombings, the angry mobs, the lynchings. We're going that way. Hey. Yeah. Look, I am speaking the language of the black man, all right? but I am not here to offend anyone. If anyone is offended, come speak up. Is there anyone here so racist they cannot understand what I've said tonight? <laughs> Only a racist could be offended. Mm. Anyone here so blinkered that they did not see the inequalities? Only that sort of person could fail to agree that change is necessary. Hmm? Mm. Is there anyone here so entrenched in their view they refuse to change? Only he could think, I am ultra-militant, trying to overthrow the state. The truth of the matter is, I love this country. Hey. Of course I do. I'm still Michael De Freitas, singing his land of hope and glory. No one loves the motherland more than I. Mm. I weep for it when it falters. I rejoice at its victories as much as the next man. I honor its customs and laws so far as I can, but for all of its misdemeanors, I strike it as I would my own ch children. And let me be the first to say, when the explosion of all the resentment and frustration does come, it will be a very Big one. Blood will run in these streets, and that blood will be black and white. Darkness. The three actors step forward to take a bow. The image fades. Thank you for watching. Michael X by Vanessa Walters, directed by Sherelle Skeet. Cast Martina Laird, Tommy Ogbaro, and Mika Onyx Johnson. Direction Sherelle Skeet. Written by Vanessa Walters. Composer Shiloh Koch. Choreographer Dwayne Barnaby. Assistant director Naomi Denny. Production Manager Daniel Palmer, Stage Manager Heather Cryan, Chief Technician Jason Westcombe, Lighting Technician Robin Fisher, Theatre Technician Fraser Craig, Production Sound Engineer Michael Woods, Sound Operator Paolo Frecaro, Sound Number 2 Dylan Debutlier, Stage Crew Jamie Platt. Logos for Almeida Theatre, Arts Council England and Principal Partner Aspen. <laughs>